Good morning and welcome to our first segment this morning. We are starting off the conversation this morning with an uh, in-depth conversation with the Honorable Francis Fonseca, past Attorney General, on his very unique view on the issue of what we should do with the ICG and hopefully while we have him here we can pick his brain on a couple of other things. Good, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here. All right. So let's start off with uh, your decision to put forward um, this perspective on the upcoming referendum and how people should vote. Sure. Um, if you'd allow me, Marlene, just to start by making two mm -hmm. very brief but I think very important points. One, this issue of Belize-Guatemala relations mm -hmm. and the unfounded Guatemalan claim to Belize, for me, is a national issue. Mm -hmm. It has never been and for me will never be uh, about, about partisan politics. It's above partisan politics. I think that's very important. Secondly, I think um, all of us are aware that passions are running high on every side of this discussion, this debate. And I think I certainly want to send the message, and I have tried to do so, um, to everyone that we all need to take a collective breath, if you like, and appreciate that people hold strong views on this issue. Um, they are entitled to do so, uh, and we have to respect people's views and opinions on this matter. Of course, um, they're not entitled to their own facts. They're entitled to their own opinions. Um, but we have to respect, and I think yeah. a lot of respect has been missing from the discussion and yeah. debate thus far, and I certainly hope moving forward um, that our discussion and debate uh, from every side can yeah. be grounded in respect. Yeah. And finally, a, a very important point for me to make, um, I think I want everyone to understand that um, I really believe that this entire issue, um, you know, it's, it's a critically important issue. Um, but for us to, to really understand and appreciate all sides, every side of this issue, we need to, I think, um, take a, a look back at the entire education campaign. I was the leader of the opposition. In fact, I think people have forgotten that in 2013, we had a major launch of the education campaign. We had a big ceremony, you can look at your archives, we had a big ceremony uh, at the Radisson Fort George Hotel uh, where both I and the Prime Minister spoke. And I think we both committed ourselves and our parties to a full, comprehensive, non-partisan, bipartisan uh, education campaign. Um, and regrettably, um, since that, after that, the truth is nothing really happened. Nothing really happened after that time. Um, so I think it's important for us yeah. to understand where we have come from and where we are today. Um, and th that, that's why I have I've reached this position yeah. in terms of saying we need to pause and, and take stock of where we are. And I think the context that you outlined is really what prompts the, the question that I ask you because people are very divisive on this issue right now and it's it almost seems impossible for people to remove uh, their own emotions yeah. or the party politics or the specific alignment that they have from the issue so knowing all of that when you introduce your perspective and your thoughts on it automatically people are trying to figure out where they should align you and your views so knowing this risk and this possible consequence why did you still decide to push forward with it either way? Yeah, I thought I thought I had an obligation to do so as uh, a leader uh, mm -hmm. in the country, as a former leader of the People's United Party, as someone who has served in government. Um, I thought an ob I had a, an obligation to do so. Um, you know, and I, I, I want to make this point as well. I think it's important that I would love for nothing more than for us to have a well-informed, confident, um, united Belize 
going to the ICJ um, to resolve this unfounded claim. Mm -hmm. um, that would be fantastic. That would be ideal mm -hmm. if we could get the Belizean people well informed. We are united in our position and we are confident about going to the ICJ. Yeah. Um, if we could do that, that would be great. But regrettably, in my view, that is not where we are today. And I don't see us getting to that position in 10 weeks before April 10th. And so I think in the national interest, I felt that in the national interest, I had to raise this issue. And, and I'm I raised it publicly, but it yeah. is something that I have been raising uh, with my colleagues and, and internally within my own party uh, for a long time. Because I think, in my view, the national interest at this time dictates that we not just get the referendum done, but we get it done right. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in terms of uh, where we are today, there's a certain uh, sense that we have set the date, we need to get it done, uh, we need to check it off, we have fulfilled our obligation as a government uh, uh, to, to, to say to, we have gotten the referendum done. Um, but I think we owe a greater obligation to the Belizean people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, today, uh, as you all have pointed out earlier, we're celebrating Mr. Price's 100th birth, what would have been his 100th birthday. And yesterday I heard my good friend and uh, distinguished colleague, uh, Senator Lisa Schumann, talk about Mr. Price's uh, efforts to lead our nation to independence. And she talked about she made a very important point about Mr. Price not giving in to the fear of and the naysayers who wanted to, to turn back, or turn away from independence. But I think she left out one very important point. Mr. Price had the full support of the Belizean people. And he always made that point. I could not achieve, I could not attain independence. I could not, I could not go forward with my fight for independence uh, if I did not have the support of the Belizean people. And I think even though there was, there was division in the country uh, along political lines about independence, Mr. Price did the long, hard work of gaining the support and confidence of the Belizean people for independence. And I think we, his example is exactly the example we need to follow. This is a critically important issue, this ICJ decision that we have to make. And we have to do the long, hard work of making sure we win the support and confidence of the Belizean people. And I really have confidence and faith in the Belizean people that if we conduct a fully, uh, you know, a balanced, well-organized campaign um, that presents to them uh, everything, all sides of this issue, that at the end of the day, they will make the right decision that is in the best interest of Belize. As Speaking of support, when you uh, speak of your position, which is essentially saying postpone the ICJ, and we'll get into the details of why, is this a position that you're putting forward as the former Attorney General, as the former leader of the opposition, or as an area representative? And what type of consultation do you, have you had with the people of Freetown to feel that you are representing their views? Right. No, I'm, I'm putting it forward uh, in all, all those capacities. Like you can't distinguish one from the other uh, in all those capacities. Um, of course, you know, I'm, my current role, of course, is as an area representative, yeah. first and foremost. Um, but certainly, you know, I have to depend on my own experience. I have said publicly, I wrote uh, publicly, that I feel very strongly that, that Belize has a very good case to go to the ICJ. I have had the opportunity to read the, the legal opinions. Um, I understand the issues. Um, so I feel that we have a very, very strong case to take to the ICJ. Um, my very deep concern is that we're headed for, in my view, uh, based on the con my own consultations that you asked about, which I have done uh, in Freetown, uh, but I've also consulted with my colleagues throughout the country. As you know, our party leader has, is currently wrapping up a listening tour. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to him about that tour. He has briefed me on that tour. And I think as he 
uh, has publicly stated, they've put out a release, um, it is clear to him uh, from that listening tour that uh, the majority of the members of our party uh, seem to be in favor of a no vote. Mm -hmm. um, and that is likely where the People's United Party is headed, as he has stated in his release. Um, so I have, it is based on all of those things and on that type of consultation that I thought that it's important for us to say, listen, uh, if we, as everyone has been saying, in, who are supporters of the yes vote, um, if we vote no on April 10th, this could have very serious negative implications for Belize, um, then I think it is important for all of us, if that is what we truly believe, we need to appreciate that that is where we're headed in mm -hmm. 10 weeks. That is where we're headed. I want to I ask one, a, a question in, in terms of the legal aspect. You speak of the confidence of the case um, and the confidence in the ICG. We've heard this um, proposal of postponing the referendum for a later time when we've had or ducks in a row um, before. But my question is, one of the very clear messages we hear from people when they talk of why they do not support going to the ICJ is a fear of the court system itself because they see it through the lenses of our local courts. Right, no. And the idea of fair or, I mean, justice is kind of redundant, but uh, the idea of, of, of being, of having a ruling that is just for Belize is one that they grapple with. Um, we hear people talk of Guatemala has more resources for better lawyers, for better experts. We hear of Guatemala having more influence and will influence judges. Um, so very clearly, they're seeing it through what we see within our own local demographic. So putting that into context, will there ever be a time that we will be able to convince Belizeans, especially those who are very adamant about no because they don't trust the court system, that the ICJ the going to The Hague can be beneficial for Belize? I think so. I mean, I think so. I don't share that fear. I believe that Belize has a strong case and that we can get justice at the International Court of Justice. I think um, that is a court that we can respect. Belizeans should not fear it. Um, so I think we can. But again, that is the very point that I'm making, uh, Kevin and Marlene, that we need to do the long, hard work. That fear, that fear is grounded in suspicion. Mm -hmm. It's grounded in, in my view, in an incompetent and chaotic education campaign. Um, take for let, let me make this point. Do you know that the 31 members of the House of Representatives, we have never had a briefing from the, uh, the ICJ referendum unit? Common sense would dictate to you that these are the 31 elected representatives of the Belizean people. Mm -hmm. uh, they can help you to guide and shape public opinion. I would think that that would be an important place to start your education campaign by ensuring bringing in these individuals, having us together and having an open discussion about this issue. Way back in 2013, way back in 2013. Um, you know, that kind of failure, mm -hmm. I think, has hurt us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it has impacted, negatively impacted the entire education campaign. Um, and my sense is today there is a lot of misinformation out there, for sure. There's a lot of misinformation, but there's a lot of mistrust, a lot of mistrust. And I think um, we need, as I keep saying, we need to do the long, hard work. Um, and I'm not talking about a deep freeze. I'm talking uh, the long, hard work of a nonpartisan, if you want to call it, or a yeah. bipartisan campaign to educate the Belizean people. For, we, we had the five foreign ministers, um, the for, former foreign ministers, uh, their declaration that they signed. Why, in my, why was that not done in 2013 at the outset of this campaign? And then have those five former foreign ministers travel the country 
travel the country, take their message to the Belizean people in every section of this country uh, and say to them why they feel so strongly uh, about a yes vote and why it is important for the future of Belize. That is the kind of campaign I think we needed to have and we can have. Um, and I think that can lead us to a place where Belizeans have confidence, uh, they are united in how they feel uh, about going to the International Court of Justice. Without that support and confidence, I think we're wasting time. Can I, in terms of um, the, the average Belizean doesn't understand, to my mind, the way that parliament works. Um, and in terms of... I, I or it doesn't work. Or, or it doesn't work. <laughs> and um, there is, to me, it's, it's like a snake. No matter how much you tell me that snake is not poisonous, I'm not going to touch it. You can give me all the science about it. The expert can sit down and say, Kevin, this, you look at its head, you look at its fangs, he bit me, nothing. I don't want to touch that snake. And I think you hit the issue, the nail on the head in terms of the work of building trust. My question is in terms of how do we gain the trust of the Belizean population when for years the rhetoric in politics has been to distrust the same people now that you want to ask me to trust. How do we move from the position of how we've always been dealing with politics to the kind of politics, the statement politics yeah. that, you're, that we need now? Yeah, it, and it might even be worse than that, um, Kevin. I mean, I, I really have been reflecting on this issue and I'm, I'm deeply troubled. I'm, I'm wondering if we've reached a point where we believe, and I mean when I say we collectively, <laughs> that, that um, buying elections, buying votes is the way to achieve our objectives and not doing the long, hard work necessary to win the hearts and minds of the Belizean people, because I've seen none of that. An issue like this requires leadership. This requires leadership. It requires the head of the country to take the lead, not five weeks or 10 weeks before, an uh, before the referendum, but five years ago, I say, this is what I believe is in the best interest of the Beli Belizean people, in best interest of Belize, mm -hmm. and lead that campaign across the country from one corner to the next. Um, that is what is required for this issue. It is as important as independence, in my view. Um, yeah. can, can I, can that I has not been done. That has not <laughs> been done. That is a failing, and we should not, you know, we should not hide from that. That has been a failing. And as a follow-up to that, one of my concerns is part of leadership is listening. It's about looking at the playing field and say, listen, I don't, I don't really like Kevin, but what he's saying there make a little bit of sense. This is a different configuration. To me, if I could outline the different configurations. The first is go to the referendum on April 10th and vote yes. That's one configuration. The second configuration is go to the referendum on April 10th and vote no. And the Third is, well, let's put it in a deep freeze for 50 years and nobody negotiate, but also let's get an agreement from the same people we can't get an agreement from, which I don't see happening. Your position is sort of a collection of all of those things where you're saying, listen, we're not ready yet, but maybe if we had a little bit more time to do these things, which I'm sure you're going to get into in a little while, then we put ourselves in a better position to hear what the people want and to get their hearts and minds together. What, what prevents the leadership, the, the leader of a country, and from all those people who have control of it? Because we live in this parliamentary democracy that there's this all or nothing sort of power. From listening and saying, listen, what the Honorable Francis Fonseca is saying is, a, is an option. It's a, it's a third option. What prevents the government? in your mind, from actually considering this, which is like a middle ground between all the positions that everyone has? I don't think there's anything standing in the way of, of them adopting my position. Um, remember, we had a 
referendum date set back in 2013. I think it mm -hmm. was October 6th or something. Um, and that date was changed because both in Guatemala and first in Guatemala, there were events unfolding and an election was forthcoming. Um, and then here in Belize, um, again, we, we turned our attention to, to elections and Mr. Barrow, in my view, was singularly focused on, on winning a third term. Um, and so I don't believe that there has been a genuine, sincere effort to have a bipartisan mm -hmm. education campaign that is balanced, that is well organized, that provides Belizeans with the information that they need to have. That has not been done. Um, and now we're jumping up uh, and signing declarations and saying to the Belizean people, vote yes. We want them to vote yes, but we have not put in the work uh, to guide them mm. to voting yes. Let me, let me just uh, kind of hone in on, on some of the things that you've been saying. One is that we should postpone. No. One is that the ideal situation is to take this issue to the ICJ. You understand the merits or you agree mm -hmm. with the fact that we have a very strong case uh, that can hold up at the International Court of Justice. But that the writings on the wall, the sentiments from the public is that we will most likely on April 10th get a no vote. So the idea of postponing is for a future date is to wait until we can surely get a yes vote from the Belizean public. This is hinged on several things. And I want to start off with the Sarstoon Protocol because this has been one of the issues we've been discussing for years. And we perhaps haven't done a recent story from the South, but one would guess that things haven't changed. We've heard from the Guatemalans and we've heard from our own representatives the very same message that why pursue a protocol now if you have the option of going to the ICJ? That's what we were told from the Guatemalan side. Uh, we know that Belize had been pushing um, and essentially Guatemala backed down from the agreement that they made in Turkey. What makes you optimistic that this is achievable when one party, quite frankly, the Guatemalans, seem unwilling to move towards it? Well, I think that we have not made a very serious effort, in my view, and certainly discussing it with, with other colleagues who I think understand this issue better than I do. Um, they believe that, and I believe that, a source tune protocol is obtainable. Um, but we have not, again, we have not done the work. We have not done the proper work. Uh, we have not, I think, engaged in a very serious way on this issue. Um, you know, we've been pressing this issue for, for, for many years, as mm -hmm. you rightly said, many years. It's not new. Um, and so when I was the leader of the opposition, I, I remember having discussions with the government about this issue um, and consistently saying to our leaders, um, we need to come together, we need mm -hmm. to sit down together uh, as opposition and government um, to try to frame this discussion and this debate about the Source Tune Protocol. Um, that was, we, we never achieved that, that was never done. So I think that we have not sufficiently uh, delved into this issue. We you feel that we're not pressuring enough for the protocol? I think, uh, not that pressure, I, I agree with the view that, listen, pressure is not necessarily going to work. But I think we've not engaged enough with all of our partners internationally, um, with the OES, um, and with all of the relevant entities. I don't think we've engaged enough and and made the case, if you like, how important this is to the Belizean people. Um, because this is where it's coming from. It is the Belizean people, everywhere you go, everywhere you go, uh, Belizean people, the Belizean people are concerned about what is taking place in the source tune. This is where a lot of the mistrust about Guatemala stems from, where it comes from. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the uncertainty about whether or not Guatemala uh, will in fact honor this judgment coming out of the ICJ because people believe that they consistently act in bad faith. 
And so I think we, as a country, as a government, needed to make it absolutely clear to Guatemala, listen, if you are serious about settling this dispute, about going to the ICJ, you need to demonstrate good faith uh, to us and to the Belizean people. Um, and that starts in the Sarstun. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of uh, discussion, that type of discussion could have led us and can lead us to a protocol um, in a Sarstun protocol. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's very much achievable. This goes back to what you're saying in terms of the haphazard nature in which we seem to be approaching this. And as much as I think the average Belizean would want it not to be so, this is where, where we are. My, my question now is, one of the things about our leaders, they have to understand the culture of our people. And I think like everywhere else, there's a saturation of information. Um, Belizeans, even for the election season, it's one month of, of one month of election. Of course, it's a year of city season, but it's one month mm -hmm. where um, Belizeans tolerate all the ads that high take intensity. up the, and the high intensity. Yeah. No, my concern is, and one of the reasons I, I, I honestly do, um, candidly, I can tell you that I support uh, your position, is because Belizeans have got a lot of information. And I'm worried that they are being saturated and after a while they tune out and go right back to their initial fear. Without, uh, because you can not have the fear and still vote no, and you can ha not have the fear and vote yes, but it has to be an informed decision. Do you think that in terms of the, what would be an appropriate time for us to work on getting to the hearts and minds of the people without saturating them with all the details. The average taxi man don't want to hear about the 1859 treaty. They want to know one question. If we go to court, will we win? Well, I think, I think it's, it's the important challenge is how you present the information to, to the people. Um, so I think people do want to to know about the 1859 treaty, but they don't want to, to hear legalese uh, about the 1859 treaty. They want to, to understand mm -hmm. what it means and yeah. what it will mean before the court when, it, when we're presenting, presenting it before the court. Um, I think, listen, in my view, we need a, a two-year campaign, a two-year campaign that is well-funded, well-organized, uh, non-partisan, um, that has good leadership, um, that is what we need. Obviously, Belize is going into an election in 2020. Um, so we can't, that will not be the time for uh, an ICJ education yeah. campaign. So it would have to be after the You're next general elections. You're talking 2021, most likely. Right, after the next general elections. Um, I think, in my view, that is the, the best course of action in my view, yeah. uh, if we are really and truly serious about what is in the national interest of Belize, and not just about fulfilling some commitment that we have made um, and saying, well, we, we did what we had to do and the Belizean people spoke, and we have to live with that decision. Um, I think that can be achieved and can be done. L let me ask this question, I think, and, and this is one perhaps that, or. Uh, or, or viewers <laughs> can relate to the most. It's a dollars and cents issue as well. We are in a difficult predicament in our economy, and if we think of the money that has been spent to get us here to April 10th and extending it for another two-year period, is that a smart decision for a country who is limited with resources? No, I mean, I th I, I'm not talking about, ex I, I mean, I'm saying that, listen, we, we would have to put the campaign on pause mm -hmm. and then resume that campaign uh, in 2021 or mm -hmm. after the general elections, yeah. um, whenever that is called. Um, I think it's worth it, Marlon. I really do think it's worth it. Um, I think... Um, to campaign this as I as I keep saying I'm yeah. repeating myself but as you're I saying, keep saying that it's not it's critically important that we get this right you're not saying that just it's that not we balanced get it done. 
it's not balanced. It's not well organized. It's not well. It's not balanced. Um, it is not providing uh, the Belizean people with the information that they need in a manner that they can fully understand and appreciate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's. I pointed out the the, 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 made, the point I made about yeah. the thirty one parliamentarians, yeah. for example. Yeah. I can tell you they hastily convened the uh, ICJ consultation in my division in, in Freetown. Mm -hmm. Hastily convened one without consulting me. Without even consulting me, they, yeah. consult, they coordinated that event with the outgoing and incoming UDP standard bearers. Mm -hmm. And what was the result? The result was that 26 people showed up. 26 people showed up and completely turned off my people because they had not consulted us yeah. and engaged with us. That is yeah. the kind of foolishness that leads to mistrust and uncertainty other, about how we move forward. Just before we move with the, with the campaign, I want to go to the, to the, uh, the um, proposal that you have with amending the Referendum Act. And, and I want to understand why uh, this is something that you're advocating for. Yeah, I think this is an, uh, an issue that uh, really been I've discussed with Eamon Courtney, Senator Courtney, who you had on. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with him that we need to amend the Referendum Act to, to make the, the decision of the referendum binding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think discussing it with him, I am, I'm guided by his views on that issue. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it makes sense, it's important. Um, so I think, I think that I mean, that would be the amendment that, yeah. that to make, make it binding, make it binding so yeah. that the government of the day would, in fact, have to respect mm -hmm. the will of the Belizean people. In, in terms of some of the groundwork, we just went through a re-registration. I don't know <laughs> if we finished it or we're... It's still ongoing. It's still ongoing. And to think that while we're on it, it I don't know, what it, it, it just seems that you would want to have finished the registration yeah. process and, and have it done properly before you go into well, this, any kind of yeah, th that's an issue I, I really I feel very very strongly about, and I can tell you, mm -hmm. a lot of my colleagues feel very very strongly about this issue, and that has led to a lot of frustration, um, and again a lot of mistrust because we are faced with many many obstacles to getting people re-registered getting people re-registered um, and certainly it is not my view that that we should go to the referendum on April 10th and it's certainly not the view of my colleagues if you go down south and go up, go up west and talk to these guys in particular they feel they are very 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 concerned um, that their voters are not on the voters list and will not have an opportunity to participate in this referendum on April 10th. Um, you know, I can tell you in some divisions, we have like uh, in Stan Creek West, for example, I think over 800 applications for birth certificates pending. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Those people can't register to vote. Um, we have many, many cases, uh, even in my own constituency, where people who have voted for 50 years can't get back on the voters' mm -hmm. list. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of So the concern is that some of the issues we're seeing at Vital Statistics are hindering the process absolutely. of registration. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And unfortunately, um, you know, people feel that there is a deliberate strategy. And many in my party feel that way, certainly, that there is a deliberate effort and strategy to frustrate some voters uh, mm -hmm. and to keep them off the voters list. Um, so that is a very, very important issue. And I think we need to sit down again, government and opposition, if we're serious about this uh, referendum, we have to sit down together and work out a bipartisan solution to those problems so that everyone can feel confident about the voters list, that we have a free and fair voters list, that our voters, their voters, everyone has had an opportunity Mm -hmm. to get properly registered and that's not the, the case right now yeah. in terms of uh you just call a very large number 800 that is a significant percentage yeah. of voters which could affect for 
um, Absolutely. Yeah. the outcome. So it would not be necessarily a true result from that uh, uh, angle. But I, I wanted to, I wanted you to expand a little bit more in terms of uh, something that's plaguing me in terms of being able to properly get the views of all our leaders. I commend you for putting your position on paper. Mr. Courtney has put his position publicly. The five foreign ministers have, or deputy prime minister has, or prime minister has. But there are quite a few other of um, your colleagues in parliament who have, to my opinion, deprived the public of saying, listen, this is where I honestly stand. Whether or not it's my personal view, or it is the view that I adopt from my party. And I believe that the, in Belize, is a popular vote. Hmm. And, and so surely there are a significant a majority of persons who want to hear from each and everyone. If, and a decision this important, I just don't want to hear from the PUP. Yeah. I want to hear right. from everyone. Yeah. Um, what do you think restricts or limits some of your colleagues in parliament, the remaining of the 31, who have not put their position forward, from really coming forward and saying, listen, I either agree with Mr. Courtney, I agree with the Prime Minister, I agree with Deputy PM, from putting, from get, giving the general public that benefit of what they think and what they believe. Yeah. I think, to be fair to my colleagues, I think, um, I think certainly down the, the Southern yeah. Caucus, for example, of yeah. the People's United Party has made their position yeah. very clear. They are no. Mm -hmm. um, I think Julius Espat in Cayo South and Karim Musa in, from Caribbean Shores. Have also are also on record mm -hmm. as being opposed to going to the ICJ. Um, I think other colleagues have, I think, out of respect, I think, uh, are waiting for the party to to make a final determination. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side, obviously, I can't speak for for ministers of government. Um, I think perhaps they are taking a cabinet position and and. I uh, believe you heard believe. that though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the cabinet is in, is in support of a yes vote. No? I think that's the case. Um, if we to look at this as, as to what seems to most likely happen, the, the People's United Party, uh, as I've said before, the writing on the wall seems to be that their united position will be a no to the ICJ. It seems that way. The yeah. Prime Minister, mm -hmm. the Foreign Minister, and most of the... Uh, current government representatives have stated publicly that they support going to the ICG, which means once again, we are in a position where there is a clear divide between what one party supports and the other. My question is, I feel that this is going to be the situation, whether it's a referendum in 2019 or a referendum in 2021, 22, 25. Um, how do you talk with voters? How do you talk with the public and ask them to remove their support for what their party sees? Yeah, I think I don't agree with you, Marlon. I don't believe that this would be the case at any point in time moving forward. I, I don't accept that. Um, I really believe, as I have said, that if we had conducted proper education campaign, yeah. if we had truly engaged the Belizean people, um, because there was goodwill, good faith. Mm -hmm. our, I certainly know in 2013, when I went to the Radisson to, to join the government mm -hmm. in declaring the opening of the education campaign, that I went there, went there in absolute good faith um, to say, let us work on this together. Let us engage the Belizean people together. All I asked of the government was that it be a balanced campaign, campaign that we not try to shove down the throats of the Belizean people one side of the discussion, one side of the debate. Them all of the facts, all of the information. We did not do that. And in that void, in that vacuum, that is where all kind of people jump up, all kind of people get up and became experts on the ICJ and holding press conferences and, and making pronouncements about the facts of but, this matter. But can it a be undone? A lot of misinformation. Can it be undone? It has to start anew. 
-hmm. It has to start fresh. There has to be a fresh start. Mm -hmm. um, that's life. Yeah. Sometimes we have to understand that something has, been, has, has died. Mm -hmm. Something has come to an end. And we need to make a new start. And I think that is the only hope for us moving forward. Honorable Fonseca, do you see in any possibility that within the next three months, there can be an injection of, of what you're speaking of, the yeah. balance that is needed in the campaign, the more um, accessible communication coming out from in the education campaign, and a further reach as well? I think it's too late, Marlene, honestly. I, I wish I could say yes. Uh, I wish I could. Um, it, 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 it pains me to say that I find no, I take no comfort in saying that I do not think we can salvage this situation. Um, I think um, <laughs> the chaos and incompetence and disorganization uh, that has surrounded the campaign will lead us. That is what will lead us to, in my view, a decisive no vote on April 10th. And that, I believe, will not be in the national interest. And we need to understand that, appreciate it, put our egos in check mm -hmm. and do what is in the national interest. Let me bring to you one of the concerns that we hear very often um, when people are deliberating this decision. The pro those who are pushing for a yes vote say exactly what you have said in your article publicly and on, on this in this conversation here, that we have a solid case. However, I've said many times to, to guests here, the expectation is that when you are going to court, that your lawyer, your per the person representing you, will be open and tell you, Marleni, we should go. But, Most likely we'll win. Worst but, case scenario, this is what we're facing. So since you share the position that this is an ironclad, ironclad case, what is the worst case scenario? Yeah, I think we or should be. what are the risks? Let be, me use that yeah, word We bit. should be, I think um, we should be very open and honest with the Belizean people. And I, I don't think any lawyer should tell the Belizean people that there are no risk involved in this matter. Um, we don't know that. We don't know that. We have a very, very strong case. Um, the, the facts and the law are on Belize's side in this matter. And we should feel good about our case. We should, fe we should feel confident about our case. Um, but the reality is that when the matter goes before the court, the ICJ, um, it is possible, it is possible that they can revise the borders of Belize. Um, I believe that's highly unlikely, uh, but it is possible that they will revise uh, uh, those borders, um, not in any significant way, um, but they may do so. I think you, you, you raise the issue with Senator Lisa yeah. um, of three kilometers or yeah. something of that nature. But I think we have to say to the Belizean people, that is a possibility. That is a possibility. And by the way, I share the view that we need, I don't know if there is in, uh, a legal opinion on the maritime areas, mm -hmm. but I, sh I certainly share that view that we need a legal opinion on the maritime areas and update it if there is one. Uh, we certainly need an updated one. Um, and we need to know exactly who this team of lawyers will be mm -hmm. that will represent Belize. Who are they uh, and exactly, uh, you know, even that sort of thing should be a part of the education campaign, man, that these are our lawyers, have them talk to the, their clients. Which lawyer don't talk to their clients, <laughs> Kevin? They need to talk to the Belizean people and understand Yes, you know, we're, we're going to engage lawyers if we have a yes vote. Um, but we certainly can, you know, we certainly can engage with lawyers and say, listen, we're having a referendum. Uh, if, this ref if the people vote yes, we, are, we want to engage you uh, to, to, to be our lawyers. But come before the referendum and talk to the people about, share with them your knowledge, your experience your expertise on this matter. You know, it's, it's, it's refreshing um, to, to get uh, a very honest perspective on this. Be yesterday, I was, I was at the bar speaking to somebody else at the bar um, because these are really real conversations to my mind 
happen, you know, particularly when there's some spirits involved. Yeah. But um, what, what the gentleman was saying... Uh, I, I was at a barber shop on Sunday. <laughs> And we had a very spirited conversation about the ICG as well. I was so. at neither. So <laughs> the conversation happens everywhere at a family uh, function. Yeah, sure. but, but that shows yeah. how important, this, yes. how much this is at the, yeah. the front of everybody's mind. Yes. No, listen, the, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt, but the, the guys in the barbershop, there were, were five or six, and then guys say, boss, we're not ready for this thing. That, 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 uh, that's what I've been saying here for the past half, what they say it in yeah. one sentence. Yeah. Boss, we're not ready for this thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's as simple as that. They understand. Yes. But the, the, um, the sentiments of the gentleman, um, who's a well-respected gentleman, said, he said, Kevin, he felt that the education campaign was not honest. And funny enough, he is a proponent for a yes vote. Right. <clears throat> and he felt that it, it came across weak because it was false, that there was an education campaign when he believed there should have been a persuasion campaign. The leaders should have gotten together, both PUP and UDP, and said, listen, and, and to get the, the third parties involved. Right, right. We all come together. Whatever you want us to change the referendum, people act, we get that done. You want us to, we get that done. And then they all came to the people and said, listen, we as the doctors, as the brain surgeons, we've been through this thing. Mm -hmm. We've all come together, we've all put this position. Now let mm -hmm. us persuade you and meet you where you are right. and bring you here. Has the approach of the education campaign to your mind, I don't want you to adopt, I don't necessarily want you to adopt the word dishonest, but um, has been weaker than it should be because it has been tried to be almost neutral, when in this case, there should have been a little bit more a leaning. No, it's, it's been a failure. It's been a failure. That is my position. It's been a failure. And that's what I said earlier. Yeah. We, we started off on the wrong foot. I mean, when we launched this campaign, let's, if you recall, you, you can go back into your, when we launched this campaign, it started out with the foreign minister yeah. himself alone going around the country. And, you know, that yeah. effectively dealt a, a, a dead blow to the, to the campaign. So we started off, on the instead of starting from what I was saying, getting the parliamentarians together, just as you were pointing out, bringing these former foreign ministers together at the outset of the camp, long ago, five years ago, signing your declaration, if you want to sign a declaration, sign it then, and go out, go out and say, listen, the collective expertise and the collective experience of our foreign ministers for the last... 35, 37 years, this is our position. Take that to every village in the country, every town in the country. That would have been a powerful education campaign, a real education campaign. We have failed the Belizean people, and now 10 weeks before the, the, the date, the decision date, the date, we want to jump up, have some ceremony, because it was more theater than substance, have some ceremony and say to the Belizean people, vote yes without having done the hard work of winning the hearts and minds of the Belizean people. We have failed the people and we have to understand and accept that and correct it before it's too late. Now, my final question. The Prime Minister has openly said he's not considering changing the date. Um, as much as time is up for this conversation, he's come uh, April 9th, to, to quote time will Courtney, he's not the king of Belize. Agreed, agreed. But there seems to be no likelihood, or there seems to be no indication that it's being considered. Let's say we proceed with the date as planned. Just like time is up for the segment, time is up on Belizeans to make that decision. Where do you see yourself in talking to any person who comes to you for advice? Will you tell them? Vote no on April 10th, even will, though you support the fact that the ICJ may be the best place to No, as it. I'm on record mm -hmm. publicly saying that I cannot support a yes vote in the current context of this education campaign. Um, so I could not, in good faith, honestly say to any Belizean, uh, I've shared my views with my Freedom Committee and with residents. Um, I cannot encourage them to say, to vote yes uh, in the current environment that we're in. Um, 
Okay. We have a lot of work to do. Can I ask my final question? And, and it might, if it's a repeat of my former question, please excuse me. But I think that, candidly, I heard the Prime Minister say that a new vote is a possibility, and I think he was being diplomatic. There were two polls um, that was on a, not necessarily uh, one that we can verify its accuracy, but there's almost a 70% of a new vote. This, this seems like an inevitability. And that only changed 10 percentage points from the first one that was done in October of 2018. It almost seems that by not changing the date and you having a very good forecast of what the outcome would be, that there is an acceptance that you almost want a new vote. Can there be some lobbying? Or what is the next step to put further muscle on the position that you have taken, which seems to be the default position, the honest position. If, if we were to wake them out of their bed at 12 o'clock, 1 in the morning, and ask them, are we ready? I'm sure the prime minister and all foreign ministers would say, we're not. How do we get them, how do we put muscle on your position to move towards getting them from the position, as Marlene has said, the prime minister said flatly, he's not considering it, to considering it and possibly actually getting it postponed? Yeah, I don't know that. Um we can do that. I don't know that we can achieve that. Um, you know, in all my dealings with Prime Minister Barrow, uh, um, I know he, when he takes a position, he's fairly inflexible. My hope is that, yes, there will be a wider discussion. That's why I'm here. Yeah. That's why I, I put my put paper, pen to paper, um, because I wanted to share my views. Um, and perhaps we can stimulate some further discussion. Yes. Yeah. And we thank you for coming in and continuing that discussion here. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, uh, as we commemorate uh, the 100th anniversary of the birth of our father of the nation, we'll be taking a look at a special video. Uh, it's George Price, Man of Purpose and Vision. That's coming up after the break. Stay tuned.